For bubble number one, the Great Depression, Goldman wasn't always a too-big-to-fail Wall Street behemoth. The ruthless face of kill-or-be-killed capitalism on steroids, just almost always. The bank was actually founded in 1869 by a German immigrant named Marcus Goldman, who built it up with his son-in-law, Samuel Sachs. They were pioneers in the use of commercial paper, which is just a fancy way of saying they made money lending out short-term IOUs to small-time vendors in downtown Manhattan. You can probably guess the basic plot line of Goldman's first 100 years in business. Plucky immigrant-led investment bank beats the odds, pulls itself up by its bootstraps, makes shitloads of money. In that ancient history, there's really only one episode that bears scrutiny now, in light of more recent events, Goldman's disastrous foray into the speculative mania of pre-crash Wall Street in the late 1920s. Basically, this great Hindenburg of financial history has a few features that might sound familiar. Back then, the main financial tool used to bilk investors was called an investment trust, similar to modern mutual funds. The trusts took the cash of investors, large and small, and theoretically at least, invested in, in a smorgasbord of Wall Street securities. Those securities and amounts were often kept hidden from the public, so a regular guy could invest $10 or $100 in a trust and feel like he was a big player, much as in the 1990s. When new vehicles like day trading and e-trading attracted reams of new suckers from the sticks who wanted to feel like big shots, investment trusts roped a new generation of regular guy investors into the speculation game. Okay, well, I'll highlight the rest, because I think it's interesting. Beginning a pattern that would repeat itself over and over again, Goldman got into the investment trust game late, then jumped in with both feet and went hog wild. The first effort was the Goldman Sachs Trading Corporation. The bank issued a million shares at $100 apiece, bought all those shares with its own money, then sold 90% of them to the hungry public at $104. The trading corporation then relentlessly bought shares in itself, bidding the price up further and further. Eventually, it dumped part of its holdings and sponsored a new trust, the Shenandoah Corporation, issuing millions more in shares in that fund, which in turn sponsored yet another trust called the Blue Ridge Corporation. In this way, each investment trust served as a front for an endless investment pyramid. Goldman hiding behind Goldman, hiding behind Goldman. Of the 7,250,000 initial shares of Blue Ridge, 6,250,000 were actually owned by Shenandoah, which of course was in large part owned by Goldman Trading. The end result, ask yourself if this sounds familiar, was a daisy chain of borrowed money, one exquisitely vulnerable to a decline in performance anywhere along the line. The basic idea isn't hard to follow. You take a dollar and you borrow nine against it. Then you take that $10 fund and you borrow 90 Then you take that $100 fund and so long as the public is still lending, borrow and invest $900. If the last fund in the line starts to lose value, you no longer have the money to pay back your investors and everyone gets massacred. Fast forward about 65 years, Goldman not only survived the crash that wiped out so many of the investors it duped, it went on to become the chief underwriter to the country's wealthiest and most powerful corporations. Thanks to Sidney Weinberg, who rose from the ranks or from the rank of janitor's assistant to head the firm, Goldman became the pioneer of the initial public offering, one of the principal and most lucrative means by which companies raise money. During the 1970s and 80s, Goldman may not have been the planet-eating death star of political influence it is today, but it was a top-draw firm that had a reputation for attracting the very smartest talent on the street. The basic scam in the internet age is pretty easy even for the financially literate to grasp. Companies that weren't much more than pot-fueled ideas, scrawled on napkins by up-too-late bong smokers, I like his turn of phrase, were taken public via IPOs, hyped in the media and sold to the public for mega millions. It was as if the banks like Goldman were wrapping ribbons around watermelons, tossing them out of 50-storey windows and opening the phones for bids. In this game, you're a winner only if you took your money out for the melon hit the pavement. It sounds obvious now, but what the average investor didn't know at the time was that the banks had changed the rules of the game, making the deals look better than they actually were. They did this by setting up what was, in reality, a two-tiered investment system. 
one for the insiders who knew the real numbers and another for the lay investors who was invited to chase soaring prices the banks themselves knew were irrational. Once again, I can't read the whole thing. It's, it's really interesting, but this will give you a bit of a feel for it. Goldman's role in the sweeping global disaster that was the housing bubble is not hard to trace. Here again, the basic trick was a decline in underwriting standards, although in this case the standards weren't in IPOs but in mortgages. By now almost everyone knows that for decades mortgage dealers insisted that house buyers be able to produce a down payment of 10% or more, show a steady income and good credit rating, and possess a real first and last name. Then, at the dawn of the new millennium, they suddenly threw all that shit out the window and started writing mortgages on the backs of napkins <laughs> to cocktail waitresses and ex-cons carrying five bucks and a Snickers bar. He, he loves this, the, the back of um, napkins <laughs> business. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. This created a mass market for toxic debt that would never have existed before in the old days. No bank would have wanted to keep some addict ex-cons mortgage on its books, knowing how likely it was to fail. You can't write these mortgages, in other words, unless you can sell them to someone who doesn't know what they are. Goldman used two methods to hide the mess they were selling. First, they bundled hundreds of different mortgages into, into instruments called collateralized debt obligations. Then they sold investors on the idea that because a bunch of these mortgages would turn out to be okay, there was no need to worry about or so much about the shitty ones. The CDO as a whole was sound. Thus, junk-rated mortgages were turned into AAA-rated investments. Second, to hedge its own bets, Goldman got companies like AIG to provide insurance, known as credit default swaps, on the CDOs. The swaps were essentially a racetrack bet between AIG and Goldman. Goldman is betting the ex-cons will default, AIG is betting they won't. There was only one problem with the deals. All of the wheeling and dealing represented exactly the kind of dangerous speculation that federal regulators are supposed to rein in. Well, didn't we just look before and see that Goldman Sachs had insinuated a lot of their people into the regulations, the SEC, etc.? I wonder why. Well, perhaps now we know. Not that Goldman was personally at any risk. The bank might be taking all these hideous, completely irresponsible mortgages from beneath gangster status firms like Countrywide and selling them off as municipal sorry, selling them off to municipalities and pensioners, old people for God's sake, pretending the whole time that it wasn't degrade horseshit. And I'll just interject here and say, well, that's what was happening to the municipalities in Australia. A lot of local government councils got done for millions of dollars, which is our money. <laughs> the little fellas, money, yeah. Okay, but even as it was doing so, it was taking a short position in the same market. In essence, big against the same crap it was selling. Even worse, Goldman bragged about it in public. The mortgage sector continues to be challenged. That's a quote by David Vinear, the bank's chief financial officer boasted in 2007. Quote, as a result, we took significant markdowns on our long inventory positions. However, our risk bias in that market was to be short, and that net short position was profitable. End of quote. In other words, the mortgages it was selling were for chumps. The real money was in betting against those same mortgages. That's how audacious these assholes are, says one hedge fund manager. At least with other banks, you can say that they were just dumb. They believed what they were selling and it blew up but Goldman knew what it was doing and and I think that pretty much says it all I won't go on any further with this we'll go down to the next bubble now there's too much more information uh, relating to the bubbles that Goldman are involved in to finish it all off on this one video so I would like you or I urge you to continue on to the next video which will be called Goldman 1C to to finish off listening to the other really shonky bubbles that Goldman have created or involved in, particularly trading in carbon and the, I suppose you could call a scam relating to climate change, all that sort of thing. It's really just a scam for people like Goldman to make money out of trading carbon. Um, further to this, I'm in the process of making some more videos, which will be Goldman 2, 3, 4, and these relate to Australia in particular, and the influence that Goldman have had on Australia and are still having on Australia. And I th the whole purpose of this video, or these two videos, is to give you some idea of what they've done in the rest of the world so that we'll give some credibility when we start talking about the influence they've had in Australia.